Hello, Sasha. So I thought today I'll tell you a story. But before I tell you a story, let me tell you a little bit about storytelling. Because storytelling, storytelling is an old and ancient art that goes back, ah, years, centuries to the Mr. Time, to before the Mr. Time. When these great isles of the mighty were ruled, not by Europe, not by the Romans, not even by the Celts, no. It goes back to a time between the sinking of Atlantis and the coming of the White Christ, when these great and glorious isles of Avalon were ruled by a strange, ancient, mysterious race of little people known as Picts. Now these Picts, or, or Pixies as some people like to call them, they loved storytelling and they still love storytelling today. And that's why when a storyteller tells a story, sometimes they sneak in through an open window or, or through the cracks in the floorboards, hide behind the chair or the wood pile, stretch out and listen to the story. And when the storyteller's finished, they give a blessing. Not just any old blessing, oh no. Because these are ancient people with ancient ways. So they give a triple blessing. Now the first part of that blessing, naturally enough, the first part of the blessing is on the storyteller for telling the story. The second part of the blessing is on the fire and the roof for keeping them warm and dry while they sit there and listen to the story. But the third part of the blessing, the third part of the blessing is on that merry bunch of people known as the audience or, or you. And they bless you for being nice and quiet and not coming out with any silly little things that totally ruin the mood of the story. Weist! The storyteller tells you a story. And that's why, when a storyteller's finished telling a story, you don't clap and cheer and go, woohoo, that was brilliant, because you scare the little people off before they had the chance to give that triple blessing. So the proper way to applaud a storyteller, the traditional way, is with two fingers like that. Unless, unless it's a really brilliant story told in a really amazingly brilliant way, like, well, like I do, then you're allowed to use four fingers like that. Here we go then. A story from my friend Sasha. Let me see. Oh yes, have I got a story for you and a, a grand one it is at that. For I'm going to tell you the tale of Jack McClaw of the Clan McClaw and how he got to repair his rowing boat. Now Jack McClaw of the Clan McClaw, like his daddy, Daddy McClaw, and his granddaddy, Granddaddy McClaw, and his great-granddaddy, great-granddaddy McClaw, Jack McClaw of the Clan McClaw, lived on a, in a, on a little croft on the banks of Loch Lomond. Now a croft, for those of you who don't know what a croft is, a croft it's a little stone cottage and a bit of land where you grow your tatters and, and maybe even a milk cow or two, if you're rich enough. Well, Jack, he had all these things, but he also had a rowing boat. And on nice days when the lock was calm and the sun was shining, Jack would pull his rowing boat out up onto the lock, row out, do a bit of fishing catch a brown trout or salmon for his supper, so he would. Well, one morning, Jackie, he yawned the stretch, stood open the curtains and looked out and thought, ah, what a grand day. This is the sort of day where I get my rowing boat, pull it out up onto the lock, get my fishing stuff, throw out, do a bit of fishing and catch myself a brown trout or salmon for my supper, so it is, oh yes, yes, yes. So that's what he'd done. He pulled his rowing boat up onto the lock and he rowed out. And he's looking up at the sky thinking, it's so warm, so sunny, so, 
so, so why do my feet feel so wet and cold? And Jack looked down in the boat and he saw there was water in the boat. And as he looked, he was getting more water in the boat. And Jack felt, ah, I'm sinking. So he started to row back to shore. But no matter how quickly he rowed, the boat got lower and lower as the water got deeper and deeper. So Jack, he stopped there and he got the bait bucket, emptied out the worms. And then he started to bow the boat out. And then he rowed, and then he bowed and rowed and bowed and rowed and bowed and stopped and gave a little prayer, dear Mary, Mother of Jesus, and bowed and rowed and bowed and rowed. Got to the bank just in time. Just before the boat sank, he jumped out, pulled it up onto the bank, sat down and thought, ho, ho, that was a close one, that was. Now, what's wrong with my rowing boat? Why is my rowing boat sinking? So he looked at his boat and he saw there was a big hole in the side of it. And Jack thought, I bet the water's coming in through that hole. What am I going to... I know what I'm going to do. If I make a hole the other side, then the water will come in here and it'll go out the... the, the no, that won't work, will it? I've got it. I need to find a piece of wood the right length, shape and size to nail over that hole, so I do, oh yes, 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 yes. So off Jack went, walking along the banks of Loch Lomond, picking up bits of wood and saying, that's too thin, that's too short, that's too rot. Every piece of wood, there was a reason why Jess would not do. So in the end, Jack thought, well, there's only one thing to do, really, isn't there? I'm going to have to go up into the hills and the highlands and look in the woods and the forest for a piece of wood the right length, shape and size to fix the hole in my rowing boat. Yes, I am. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Yes. So off Jack went, trudging up into the hills and the highlands and into the woods and the forest and he is looking down at the floor going, that bit's rotten, that bit's got a hole, that bit's got such a big hole that there's not actually anything there anyway. That bit, in fact, Jack is so busy looking at the wood on the floor. Jack didn't see the clouds come over. The thick, dark, black, ominous clouds. Jack didn't see them till it started to rain. And it didn't just drip, drip, drop little April showers. Oh, oh no. It was piss, 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 persistently raining, it really was. And Jack thought, I'm miles from home and it's piss, 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 persistently raining and I'm going to catch a cold and die of pneumonia and then what am I going to do? What? Over there, through the trees, there's a light. And where there's a light, there's shelter, and where there's shelter, there be people. I'll go over there and see if I can shelter from the storm there, so I will. So off Jack went. And sure enough, the light came from a little cottage. And Jack went out to the cottage and went. And the door went. And there stood an old, an old lady. And she said, yes, can I help you? And Jack said, I'm sorry to bother you, madam, but I was looking for wood to repair my own boat so I can have a brown trout for supper when it started to rain. I'm miles from home and I don't want to catch a cold and die of pneumonia. And then, 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 and could I come in and shelter from the storm, please? Oh, of course you can, of course you can. Come on in, Jack, come on in. And you're in luck, because my two sisters are here. And we're having a bit of a Kaylee. Now, a Kaylee. For those of you who don't know what a Kaylee is, a Kaylee is where, it's where your clan or your family get together and you have a munch. And then after you'd had a munch and a couple of drams, you, you get down a fiddle, you get down a bow and you, you play a bit of music, a bit of motorhead, ACDC and generally let your hair down and party, so you do. So there Jack is, sitting by the fire, shivering, soaking wet, dripping onto the floor while these three old ladies, they... They play on their harps and their whistles and their fiddles. And then after a while they stopped. And the first old lady, she looked at Jack and she said, Oh, are you hungry, Jack? Do you, do you want something to eat? And Jack said, oh, You know, I wouldn't say no, because 
Cause I'd had a hard day what with rowing and bowling and playing and picking up bits of wood and sitting here listening to you playing on your house and your whistles and your fiddles and I something to munch go down ground. Thank you very much. So she went out to the kitchen, came back with a tray, put it on Jack's lap, and oh, there is not a meat in the world that was not there on that tray cooked. Mwah! To perfection. And Jack sat there munching away, thinking, oh, this is really rather grand, this is. Why, the old ladies played on their harps and their whistles and their fiddles, and, and then they stopped playing a second time. And the first old lady, she looked at Jack and she said, Oh, oh, you thirsty, Jack, do you? Do you want a wee dram? And Jack said, oh. You know, I wouldn't say no, because... I'd had a hard day, what with bowing and bowling and praying and picking up bits of wood and munching while you're playing on your house and your whistles and your fiddles and I something to drink and go down grand. <gasps> Thank you very much. So she went off to the kitchen and came back with a bottle and a glass and gave it a jack and Joe went glug, 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 glug. Glug, 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 glug. Mmm. Mmm. It was the finest, the very most finest single malt whiskey Jack had ever tried. And believe me, in his life, Jack had tried a single malt or two. So Jack, he sat there drinking the whiskey while the old ladies, they played on their house and their whistles and their fiddles. And then, and then they stopped playing a third time. And the old lady, she looked at Jack and she said, Ah! Uh -huh. Oh, you tell you, Jack. Do you want a bed for the night? And Jack said, Oh, yeah, I wouldn't say no, because I'd had a hard day. We'll be blowing and bowling and praying and picking up bits of wood and monkey and drinking while you're playing on your horse and your fizzles and your whistles and I stuff in the paper go down grand. <sighs> Thank you very much. So she took Jack upstairs and showed him a room with a beautiful four-poster bed. And the mattress on this bed was so soft that you poked one end and the other end sort of flippity flapped up and down for a while. And Jack, he laid on it. He all just stretched out. It was really quite grand. And Jack was just about to go to sleep. When downstairs, he heard the old lady say. And then she said. Be he 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 he. Well, I think he's asleep now, sisters, so it's time to start our magic work. And Jack, he sat up in bed and he thought, Oh no, there's fear for them, that old, old ugly, she's got a weird laugh. <gasps> They're witches, they're going to wait till I'm asleep and cook me, put me in the oven and have me for breakfast, so they are, oh, yes, what am I going to do, what am I going to do? I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to open the door just a little bit, peek out with one eye and see if I can make good my escape. Yes, I am. Oh, yes, 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 yes. So Jack, he went to the door and just, eh, the door, just, just half the pickled onions were and peeked out with one eye. And there we saw the three old ladies downstairs and they were dragging this big heavy chest in the middle of the room and then they got hold of the lid and went eh, eh. and the first old lady the first old lady she reached into it and she took out a little black hat she put it on her head and she said off to the king's wine cellar with you little flash of light and a puff of smoke and she had disappeared and the second old lady, well, the second old lady, she reached into the chest, took out another black hat, put it on her head, said, Off to the king's wine cellar with you. Flash a light little puff of smoke as she disappeared. And the third old lady, well, the third old lady, surprise, surprise, the third old lady, she reached into the chest, took out a little black cap, put it on her head, said, Off to the king's wine cellar with you. Flash a light little puff of smoke. And she too 
disappeared. Well, Jack, he stood upstairs watching all this with one eye through the door, and he thought, This really is getting a wee bit strange, this is. I know, I'll go downstairs, I'll have a look in that chest, and then I really will make good my escape, yes I will, oh, yes, 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 yes. So he went downstairs and he looked in the chest, and there, at the bottom of the chest all alone, was one last black cap. Well, Jack, he put it on his head and said, Off to the king's wine cellar with you. And Jack felt like he was twisting and tumbling and falling. Then his vision cleared, and Jack was sitting on the floor, not the dirt floor of the cottage, but now a big cobbled stone floor, and he was between two ginormous barrels. And round the corner of the barrels, Jack heard, Bee! And he thought, I know that laugh. That's those three old ladies, that is. So Jack, he peeped round the corner of a barrel, and sure enough, he saw that he was now in the king's wine cellar, and the three old ladies were there as well. And the first old lady, she went up to a barrel, she poured a drink, she went, he yes. um, 58 Beaujolais, I do believe. This'll do nicely. Off home with ya. Flash of light. Little puff of smoke and she and the babble disappeared. And the second old lady, she went up to a barrel, she poured a drink. Oh yes, oh yes. A 68 Claret, um, north side of the vineyard, I do believe. One of my favourites. This'll do nicely. Off home with ya. Flash a light, little puff of smoke. She and her babble disappeared. And the third old lady, she went up to her babble, she poured a drink, went, hey, yes, hey, yes, um, alcohol, one of our favourites, this will do nicely. And this one, off home with ya. Flash a light, little puff of smoke, she and both babbles disappeared. Well, Jack, he's watched all this, and Jack thought, you know, this really is such a strange day. In fact, it's so strange that it's, it's left me with a bit of a dry mouth, so I has. So I'll, I'll just try one wee dram for one of those bottles and then I really will use this hat to make good my escape. Yes, I will. Yes, 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 yes. So Jack went up to a bottle. He poured a drink. Mmm. One of the sweetest, one of the very most sweetest meads Jack had ever tried in his life. And Jack thought, I have had to do me. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought, you know, this has got mead in it. I wonder what that barrel over there has got in it. So Jack, he walked over to that barrel, poured himself a drink. Oh, it was a beautiful Napoleon brandy. Now, Jack. Jack had never tried a Napoleon brandy in his life, but he had a kick like a mule, and that was good enough for Jack. So Jack said, Hi, this'll do nicely. Oh, 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 oh. you know, this has got a kick like a mule, and that's got a me. What's that barrel over there got in it? So Jack, he staggered to that barrel, then he staggered to that one and crawled to that one, and he was crawling to that one when Jack stopped. And Jack thought, I'm going. Yes, a little bit tiddly, yeah. So I'm going to be sensible. I'm going to take this magic hat, put it here in my back pocket where I can't lose it. And then I'm going to try that babble. And he crawled over to that babble and crawled to that one. And, well, Jack was on his way to that one when he kind of, he kind of passed out fast asleep. So fast asleep was Jack that Jack didn't wake up till he was woken up. And he was woken up by two big hefty guards with cauliflower ears and flat noses. And they said, ah, caught you at last, have we? 25 years you've been raiding the king's wine cellar. Don't know how you've been doing it, but now we caught you. Ho, ho, are you in for a sunshine? And before Jack could do or say anything, they grabbed him. They tied his hands behind his back. They took him up the hard, bouncy stone stairs, along a corridor with a posh red carpet, and threw him down in front of the throne. And sitting on the throne was the king. Oh, 
Now the king, the king at the time, the king, he was only 12 inches tall, but he made an excellent ruler. And he sat, sorry about that joke. He sat there and he said, ah, caught you at last, have we, Jack? 25 years you've been raiding my wine cellar. Don't know how you've been doing it, but now one has caught you. One is going to make an example of you. Tomorrow you're going to be burnt to death at the stake. Take him away. And they took Jack away, dragged him back along the corridor with the posh red carpet, down the hard bouncing stone stairs, past the wine cellar and threw him into the deepest, darkest, dunkest dungeon. But, and this is an important but, so I'll say it again. But! They didn't untie Jack's hands. So all night long, Jack is sitting there trying to get this magic hat out of his pocket, but he can't reach it. And, and through the window, he can see the moon coming up. And he's really trying to get it out. And, and now he can see the moon going down. And he still can't get this. Can't get this hat. And he heard the girls coming along the cover door. He heard the key turning in the lock. And the girls came in. And they took Jack. And they dragged him, kicking and streaming, back up the hard, bouncy stairs along a corridor that didn't have a posh red carpet and outside to the courtyard. And in the courtyard, in the middle of the courtyard, was this long, straight plank of wood with lots of little bits of wood round it. And Jack was tied to it. And out came the executioner. A fat man with a black mask and heavy arms and he looked at Jack and he said, Do you want a blindfold, Jack? And Jack said, No, certainly not. My, my daddy, Daddy McClure, he never had a blindfold when they executed him. And my granddaddy, Granddaddy McClure, he never had a blindfold when they executed him. And my great-granddaddy, Great-Granddaddy McClure, he never had a blindfold when they executed him. And my great great All right, Jack, we get the message. You don't want a blindfold. No, I don't. However, I wouldn't say no to wearing a traditional McClure execution cap. A what? A traditional McClure execution cap when us, when us McClaws are executed, and it's quite often we are. It's traditional that we wear a traditional McClure execution cap. In fact, you're not allowed to execute us without one, so you're not. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, I ain't got one. Oh, well, you're in luck there, because it just happens. If you look in my back pocket, you will find a McClure execution cap. And if you put it on my head, I'll be only too happy to let you execute me. So I will. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Thank you. I think, said the executioner. And he took the magic hat out of Jack's pocket. He put it on Jack's head. And then he lit the wood. And just as the smoke was beginning to curl up Jack's nose and his toes were beginning to warm up, Jack went, Oh, fall with you! And Jack felt like he was twisting and tumbling and falling. And then when his vision cleared, he was still tied to this long straight plank of wood. But now he was tied to it, sitting on the banks of Loch Lomond, staring at his rowing boat. And Jack fell, oh, 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 oh. That was a close one, that was... That's a tale to tell the family on a cold winter's night, so it is. <sighs> However, I still haven't found a piece of wood that's long enough and straight enough and wide enough to fit my... You know, this plank I'm tied to, if I just do the job. So Jack wiggled and niggled and wiggled until the plank came out and that loosened the ropes enough to get his hands free. Picked it up out, perfect fit. Just sawed a bit off the end, nailed it into place. And that is how Jack McClaw, of the Clan McClaw, got to repair his rowing boat. Hope you like the story, Sasha. Maybe in a week or so I'll do something else for you. We shall have to see.
Bye-bye, my dear.